Good afternoon. It's my uh, pleasure to introduce Dr. Rich Rotuno, a senior scientist in the Mesoscale Microscope Meteorology Lab at the uh, National Center for Atmospheric Research out in Boulder, Colorado. Um, it, while at uh, NCAR, he served in a number of different capacities uh, as assistant director, interim director, and ultimately director of NCAR's Mesoscale Microscope Meteorology Division at various stages of his career. He earned his PhD in geophysics from Princeton University. Um, his research has ranged over a wide variety of topics in mesoscale dynamic meteorology, including tornadoes, rotating thunderstorms, hurricanes, clouds of precipitation, thermally driven circulations, orographic flows, um, coastally trapped disturbances, you name it, in mesoscale. He's had some uh, a finger in uh, all of these sorts of problems. So through a combination of theory and numerical modeling, his work is directed at understanding the, uh, directed at the understanding needed to make progress in the forecasting mesoscale weather phenomena and also understanding its predictability. He's a two-time recipient of the AMS's Banner I. Miller Award. He's also the recipient of the Joel Charney Award in 2004. And for his elegant, rigorous work that has fundamentally increased our understanding of mesoscale and synoptic scale dynamics, especially the role of vorticity in the atmosphere, the AMS's highest uh, medal, the Carl Gustav Rossby uh, Medal in 2017, as well as a Lifetime Achievement Award in 2018 for his research in severe local storms. He's been an active participant in national and international committees, summer schools in Colquia, concerning the science of weather and weather forecasting. And uh, we're really delighted to have him here today to talk about the direct numerical simulation of lead vortices in two-layer flow. So welcome to Madison Rich, and look forward to your talk. Thank you. So uh, thank you very much for inviting me. Very happy to be here today. When I uh, saw Michael this morning, it reminded me of the first time I saw him in front of, in front of a bunch of uh, paper weather maps at MIT. <laughs> And now I walked into the room, we had a bunch of electronic weather maps. <laughs> <laughs> Here's a pointer if you'd like. He's got his own. Oh, you got your own. So, uh, good. It's good to be here. And uh, I'd like to, um, like to tell, I'd like to tell you this story. Uh, the um, the uh, paper is still under review, so the final word is not in yet um, uh, from the reviewers. So this is a direct numerical simulation of lead vortices and uh, two-layer flow. And uh, let me get jump right into it. So uh, this is a uh, picture from the space shuttle of uh, the flow around the island of Hawaii. <coughs> Over here, here the, here the trade winds as he's uh, coming along like this. And uh, there's a trade wind inversion. Uh, that, that caps the flow, and the flow can't surmount this uh, three kilometer tall obstacle that kind of goes around like this. And you can see that uh, you can visualize that there are uh, that there are lead vortices behind the island. Just these clouds are kind of coming back this way. If you don't uh, if you don't trust the, uh, the your eyes, there are some uh, there was a field experiment carried out and showed that this is precisely the flow that's observed. Uh, that we get flow from around the island, we will to see that that form in the, uh, on down inside of Hawaii. So uh, about uh, 30 years ago, uh, my colleague uh, Peter Spolakevich, he was doing simulations of this, numerical simulations of this flow, and uh, he came to my office one day and said, uh, well, uh, you know, you're supposed to know something about fluid dynamics and more statisticity. Uh, what do you think about uh, various theories, raisins? One of the, the theories at the time was that since these kind of flows require strong stability and low flow, uh, that what happens is that there's sort of a two-dimensional flow separation. So the layers here can't move in vertical, and they separate the flow separation that produces these, uh, these eddies on the east side. So I said, well, you know, we need a numerical model. We can, we can test that idea right away. Why don't you just you know, turn off the frictional contact between the flow and the obstacle. And your, your vortices should go away, and we'll confirm that theory and, uh, and move on. So he came in the next day, and he said, well, I, I, I tried this with pre-slip conditions, and my vortices are still there, and in fact, they became stronger. So I said to uh, Peter, I said, well, uh, Two possibilities here. One possibility is that uh, is that there is a, a problem with the numerical model, and he bristled and said, "No, there's no problem with model." 
And I said, okay, well then the other possibility is that, uh, that there's a mechanism that no one's thought of yet for uh, producing a vortices in the absence of frictional contact uh, of the flowing obstacle. And so uh, in thinking about it and doing some analysis, we came up with the following uh, idea. And you know, there is a source of vorticity because it's a stratified flow. And uh, when you have a stratified flow, a stably stratified flow, uh, when the flow tries to pass over the obstacle, the isotropes will flow up and then they will flow down. So in passing uh, from the cool to the warm side, we produce uh, paraclinically uh, vorticity horizontally. So uh, that's just part of a uh, part of gravity. And so if you're down here looking upstream, <coughs> up here, looking upstream, this little med uh, negative uh, will now be pictured as this uh, vortex line, like that. And if you take the right hand, and the right hand rule, this uh, vortex line, and as the flow passes over the obstacle, and the flow descends just down on the downstream side of the obstacle here, Not, and there's no, there's no reflection of the flow in the cross-stream direction. So the flow coming down here uh, acts to the uh, tilt. Uh, the vorticity will be produced there clinically, and uh, so it's such that uh, we have this kind of tilting on this side, this, and that basically explains the vorticity distribution we're seeing in those, uh, in those simulations you know, in the absence of uh, any kind of frictional contact with the, with the obstacle. We develop a linear theory and a second order direction to show that because in, in, the, in the linear theory, baroclinic production only works in, in boost mask approximation. The, uh, the, the vorticity is only produced in the horizontal plane. And in order to uh, get the uh, vorticity to, to go into the vertical plane, you have to tilt it. And that occurs at second order in, uh, in, a, in, a, in a, an expansion, an amplitude. We realize that that, uh, that, that is a uh, consequence of the, uh, the conservation of potential vorticity. And so we did a uh, kind of crude graphics. This is pre neighbor pre dis 5D, pre, pre all that stuff. And, yeah, Peter somehow uh, made this work. Um, these are vortex lines on an isotropic surface. And as long as the vortex line lies in the isotropic surface, then the geometrical statement here is that the vorticity rate is, uh, is, uh, is, uh, is dotted with the gradient of theta is zero. And so it just says no vortex lines penetrate through the vortex or can be moving up and down with the, uh, with the, with the, with the surface. So what we have here is that uh, this line here pointing into the page is like this one, not pictured here. These lines passing from, from here to here are like this one. And then tilting down at this one, tilting up at this one. And we have a vortex pair. And so uh, we're pretty happy about that. So uh, no one's thought about this yet, of getting uh, a vortex pair from the baroclinic uh, vorticity uh, mechanism. Simulations have been done, the engineering li the literature on uh, stratified flow past spheres and that sort of thing. And it, it was always, since no one thought of you know, setting, setting the uh, Condi you know, the no slip condition to a free slip condition, and we thought it in some way or another connected to, uh, to, to, uh, to the boundary condition. So we were happy about that. Now, a very famous person in the field was unhappy about our conclusion. Yes? Rich, uh, was there a uniform flow coming from the yes. right in the lower layer? Well, throughout. Well, it was uniform. Right yeah, no mean shear, therefore no tilting and mean shear vorticity. So, yeah, that was by design. We took, let's put in no, no mean flow shear so that there, there can't be any confusion about no uh, rotation. No rotation. So uh, we noted that the, you know, right at the center of these, uh, of, the, of these pits here, some of the vortex lines penetrate through. And that means that the, if the vortex lines go through the isotropic surface, that means that PV is not zero. And Ron Smith wrote a comment on our paper saying, well, 
if the dv is not zero, that is the fact, and that fact, not the existence of vertical vorticity, is the salient point. So, um, so I, w I went to the dictionary to look up salient. <laughs> <laughs> but it kind of means the most important point. Okay, well, um, that's what we argued back. We said, well, wait a minute, no one had thought of this mechanism for vorticity production. So uh, this is an additional point, but I don't think it's the salient point. And in response, they said, well, what if, what if we showed an initial value problem? And uh, years later, I did it with uh, Craig at the And I'll just skip this one. And uh, this is the initial value problem. Here's an isotropic surface. And these are vortex lines. And the color just uh, represents a sense. So these are going around this way, and these are going around that way. And so, uh, and the color of the surface represents displacement upward, and the red means displacement downward. And uh, during this initial value problem, we put the obstacle into motion, and you see the surface is going up, going down, and you can see that the, these vortex lines are tilting to the vertical here. And this time here, uh, I think most people would say that a vortex is formed, three vortices are formed, but yet, as these vortex lines are in the isotropic surface, is zero PV at this time. So if PV is so important, how do I get vortices here under conditions of zero potential vorticity? Now, as the flow evolves further, this tongue of high, you know, this tongue of, of, of potential temperature, this cold air comes around and reconnects. And when it does, it captures the vortex lines, and now, and now you can have a, a, a circulation. Uh, if you draw a circuit, now you can find the circuit where the uh, there's circulation of the isotropic surface. That means the PV has been created. So rather than uh, if, you know, rather than, than thinking that PV creates vortices, uh, we argued back to Ron Smith said, "Well, no, it's the, vort it's the vortices that create the PV. <coughs> it's the vortex motion. It's in the DNA of the of the, of the Euler equations to produce this kind of motion. And but when it gets to this stage here, viscosity reconnects the surface on itself, and that's when you get PV. So yes, in the steady state, there's PV." But it's no more important than, uh, than I'd say it's less important than the fact that uh, the, the vorticity was supplied by direct production of vorticity. So uh, the debate went on. Uh, so well, what about this case here? What if we have wave breaking above the obstacle? And we uh, know there's, uh, there's basically friction in here. That may supply force backwards. And that force uh, produces a weight, and that weight you know, produces vorticity, and uh, doesn't necessarily know anything about barrier production. So, um, and to support that point, uh, Christoph Scher and Ron Smith did some simulations of using shallow water equations over a 3D obstacle, and uh, run in a range where you expect. Uh, a hydraulic jump to form based on the shallow, based on the, the theory of Houghton and Casabano. So uh, this black line here indicates a hydraulic jump that forms in the shallow, shallow water theory. And the idea basically is that as the flow goes through the jump here, it, uh, it loses the uh, uh, head and the uh, flow slows down. And, and you can show, Chris F. Shire and his theorem showing the, the equivalence between the loss of the really head and the creation of potential vorticity. So in the shallow water equations without F, the potential vorticity is just the vorticity divided by the height of the layer. So it's almost the same thing. So you can't get vorticity without getting potential vorticity. So from the point of view of the, uh, uh, the shallow water equations, uh, the lee vortices and the dissipation uh, go hand in hand with PV creation. PV, vortices, vortices, PV. Okay. Uh, so that kind of motivates this talk. So, okay, well, uh, so we have from the two, two layer shallow water equations run past the 3D obstacle, the interface of the, of the, the layer completely covered the obstacle in this, 
in this previous uh, picture. So the obstacle is just completely covered by the, the lower fluid, creates this high motor jump. So we have uh, the two layer shell, one equation, steady state, dissipation, PV, re vortices. In the primitive equation, as I showed you an initial value problem, that showed these vortices form with PV equals zero. But a steady state PV is created. And so, uh, so this talk then is about, well, okay, but what is the source of vorticity? Even if, even if the PV is, okay, say, most you postulate PV is not zero. <laughs> That's important. But that means omega dot delta eta is not zero. That means omega is not, omega is not zero. But in all these simulations, omega is zero upstream. So how did it acquire vorticity to make that PV? Okay, so even if you say, okay, PV is important, where did it get the vorticity that goes into the PV? So what I want to do today then is say, okay, let's go look at this uh, situation of a two-layer shallow water equation. So what we'll do is look at it with uh, a finite thickness in the transition between the density of the lower fluid and the density of the upper fluid. A finite transition layer, and let's do the problem using a, the primitive equation. You know, full non-hydrostatic uh, Navier-Stokes equation. And so, uh, why do you need to do that? Well, okay, let's look, let's look at the hydraulic jump. Um, in, uh, in applied math, these solutions like this would be called weak solutions, and they're weak because uh, they're really not solutions anymore. What we, what we do is, that if you do a time-dependent problem, uh, the uh, this interface starts to become double valued, and once it becomes double valued, the, uh, the, the shallow water equations fail. And what you do is you fit this, you fit this, uh, this, uh, this continuity in here, and you match mass and momentum across it, and when you, when you do that, you can continue the solution everywhere else, except in here you've got a parameterization. So, uh, but what goes on inside of this? Well, you can't know that from the shallow water equations. In the laboratory, this is what this is the hydraulic jump. And it's this rolling motion. If you ever been uh, river rafting, you come down in here and you say, "Oh, wait a minute, this is all coming back in here." So, uh, and there's tons of laboratory data to show you that this is what happens. So, if you take a little river raft, come in here, uh, you have to row, row, row to get out of it. Okay, so basically, the takeaway message from this seminar, I'm going to show it in a bit. The takeaway message is that if you're, if you're looking at, say, you're taking a hike on a nice day and looking down at a submerged rock that you hear a flow coming over, this flow is rolling back and back like this, that rolling motion has ends. And those ends are connected to that rolling motion. So these are the lead releases. Uh, that are connected to the rolling motion in here. So we, if you want to understand lead vortices, the mechanics of lead vortices, just looking at shallow water equations and looking at dissipation from here to here is not going to tell you anything about the mechanics of that rolling motion. And that's a critical feature of understanding the lead vortices. So uh, there's an old saying in our business that you could say it with vectors and you could say it with tensors, but Nobody understand. Nobody believes you unless you say it with Fortran. So <laughs> they say it with Fortran. Uh, we did a numerical simulation of uh, this this flow. So it's a uniform flow uh, with density that goes that increases by 10 degrees Celsius over this layer, about one kilometer thickness, and with a center here at uh, at um, if I say it. Uh, but yeah, I think that's about a kilometer here. The mountain is here down below. And so this is basically what we're trying to do here is, is, is use, a, use the numerical model, the full Navier-Stokes equation, to simulate the case that the shallow water equation is attempting to simulate. The shallow water equation is basically a two-layer fluid with a discontinuity in the, in the density stratification in principle, because you're going from one density here to a lower density here. So in a, in a finite difference model, you smooth that out like that. So, so effectively, it's like two and a half layers. So the, the layer down below, the layer below, 
and then the transition layer here. And uh, I'm going to run this uh, for uh, a case where you expect to see a hydraulic jump in the uh, shallow water equations. Um, so uh, once you set the height of the mountain, the flow speed, the reduced gravity that's due to the change of delta theta across the, uh, the inversion here, then you can go to the, you know, the famous diagram by Houghton and Kasahara, the famous paper on shallow water theory. And uh, you go to that diagram and look for the cases, look for the places in that diagram where you have a stationary hydraulic jump on the lee side of the obstacle. Pick the parameters so that you're in that regime. And uh, one more parameter you need to choose is the viscosity, because these are now the Stokes equations. And you chose the viscosity to be large enough uh, just large enough to produce a turbulent flow, not as large as the actual atmosphere, but large enough to produce a turbulent flow so that when, when this produces a, when this flow produces a, a turbulent lee side flow, it'll be honest to God, Navier Stokes, turbulent without parameterization. So there'll be no question should be no questions asked on, on that account. So let me show you uh, Looking at here, so this is the lowest isotope I visualized with, uh, uh, with uh, the uh, visualization program uh, of NCARB. Again, vapor. Vapor. This is the old thing. This is vapor. So we're going to look at this, this isotope. I'll play it again. Flow is coming over the mountain here. You see that the uh, flow is turbulent. And uh, we'll take a closer look at it in a minute. I'll just let it run again. So it develops into a statistically when the first wave comes over, crashes, you see the lead of lead vortices is forming, and then I'll show you in a minute that it keeps on going through episodes of overturning, crashing, and lead vortex formation. What's your grid space on? Uh, 20 meters. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> just a note on the, uh, the grid space. The grid spacing uh, delta, delta Z compared to the outer scale of the turbulence is around 20.02. Mm -hmm. which is within the range of uh, recommended by Moyne and Kim for uh, direct numerical simulations of turbulence. The, the uh, direct numerical sim simulations of tur turbulence should have that parameter around less than uh, something le less than about 15 times the common scale for sure. Are these status turbulences curling underneath themselves? Yes. The turbulence? Yes. Yes. This, this data, we're looking at this data surface here. And it's coming back, crashing down. That's it. And then it. Yeah, so just think of it as if this, if your boat is here, you're coming over. And you're here. So, but uh, this is the side view. I just want to make a technical note here. We use a free slip condition on this curved surface. That tends to produce vorticity. But since we have the elevated, um, Barophytic zone here. It's it, the, the source of vorticity due to the uh, barophytic production is clearly separated from any uh, artificial uh, vortex layer on the obstacle. So if you focus on what's happening here, this uh, the, uh, the, uh, this layer kind of comes down, splits, makes a lot of negative vorticity. Again, take the right hand and go like this. The thumb should be pointing to the back of the room. I think of this kind of vorticity with the, uh, with, the, with the blues here. This splits this layer, brings it up to here, and uh, then we have sort of a positive vorticity on the, on the, on the upper side. Do you think of that as a, a bit like a vortex, an eddy shedding regime for uh, uncurling vortex streets with Reynolds coming around 5,000 to flow around the cylinder? It's sort of pulsating, detached eddies. I don't know if that's an, an analogy. Well, it, it, around a cylinder, there's the, uh, without stratification, there's, just, there, there's only the uh, viscous uh, flow separation mechanisms. We don't have that here. Does that basic process that we're visualizing here explain the dustiness of older windstorms? Could be. Could be. Could be. Yeah, but it's only 5,000. You know, they, I'm not, um, there's no claim here of Reynolds number independence. To be only that this is the turbulent flow you usually would observe at around number 5,000. So, uh, let me draw your attention to this. This is coming, 
as this thing comes down, you watch the first one, you see, you see the, uh, the corresponding positive and negative that go with every time you draw down. Draw down, positive, negative, and now it's all permanent. And so all subsequent events are in this, in the wake of the, the previous events that are uh, staring up the flow. If we uh, take the last hour of this two hour simulation average, and this is the average picture of the two hours. And uh, I'll let you look at that for a minute. I have a prompt. Mm -hmm. I need a prompt for my next uh, slide. This Okay, so um, so in the steady state, so see we're, we're taking uh, we have the horizontal vorticity of the negative sort here coming down, and through this plane, that purple line, we have the positive vorticity on the right side, negative on the left. And of course, and we're going to do an analysis in this box of uh, the sources and sinks of positive vorticity. And of course, you know, by, since, since there's no Coriolis force, uh, by the circulation theorem, there's no net vorticity, so it wouldn't make sense to do an analysis around the whole thing. So we ask, where does this vorticity come from on this side? And uh, yeah, so let's do the analysis. And to do the analysis in perhaps the most general way is to look at the vorticity equation in flux form. Uh, and in this paper by Haynes and McIntyre, 1987, I recommend it. It's mainly on potential vorticity and about the impermeability. If you've heard about this impermeability theorem, a lot of these sort of uh, you know, remarkable properties of potential vorticity are inherited from the vorticity equation. And uh, so uh, this is uh, this is this is the vorticity equation in uh, flux form. It's exact. Nothing think like it. And uh, the property about it I'd like you to focus on is that, that the, uh, the vertical flux of vertical vorticity is zero. Identically zero. That just doesn't show up in the, uh, in the flux form. And the reason for that is that, you know, it, you know, or more generally speaking, the, the flux of vorticity along that component direction that you're interested in is always zero. And the reason is that uh, if I'm interested in, say, the vertical vorticity, the only way to change the vertical vorticity is by applying horizontal forces. And so it's the curl of those horizontal forces that change the vertical vorticity. And they show up as fluxes when written in this form. So this is, so, so if you think of these as, as, as the curl of the force, this is d by dy of a force in the x direction or d by dx force in the y direction. It's the curl of the force, and this is, these are the these, you know, these are the advection terms. This is the viscous term, and the other parts of the advection term go away because they're, uh, they they have zero. They, they, they don't have they don't have any they have zero uh, contribution. Anyway, this is uh, so this is exact. So uh, let's uh, use this to uh, to uh, analyze our vorticity. And so basically, it, it all reduces to them, and, and the time event in, in, uh, in, the, in, the, in the time average state, the time tendency term goes to zero. And so what we're looking at here is the uh, is basically the horizontal flux is into and out of this box. And so here's the box. We produce in this figure here. This is the box, and these arrows now represent these flux vectors. There's the x flux. Is the x component and the y component, and so uh, and, and, and the viscous, the direct viscous contribution is small, as it is in you know, any kind of mean flow analysis uh, that you do with turbulence. So, uh, so you have this. This is uh, basically the product of the uh, of the average of the products. So I said, okay, well, if there's uh, some turbulent, some direct turbulent contribution. I want to see a difference between uh, doing this, uh, analyzing the, uh, the the average of the products, or 
the uh, product of the averages. And what you see is hardly any difference. And I'll just toggle back and forth. So it means, at least in the vertical vorticity equation, the direct contributions of turbulence are negative. Okay, so uh, the final approximation, and again, this is just sort of playing with the uh, analysis, is that I said, well, okay, so at the end, what I'm going to want to do is do a, an integral around the box, because if you see the vorticity coming in, positive, positive vorticity coming from the left side to the right side. So it's basically taking from here, putting it here. So it's one of these problems where you have a, a non injective flux kind of digs a hole of positive vertical vorticity here and pulls, makes it out right here. So uh, I'm interested in this in this uh, this term here coming through this boundary. Uh, v bars probably small through symmetry. There's no mean flow in the north-south direction here. So uh, and then uh, going out back here, W kind of settles down into very small. So I just Let's let's do the let's do the uh, analysis then looking at the second approximation, and that's just keeping those terms. So you have know, flux out this way. That's this one. And this term here is the important one. That's that's what's bringing the vorticity in. Uh, but it's not an effective flux. It's minus W A. That is the term that makes this uh, this uh, this flux that comes from the left to the right side. So what is the uh, so where does that come from? Why is that why is that going from here to here? Well, uh, we'll get to that in the next slide. But this is a, basically the integrate around the flux. This box, we see that the flux of the vorticity, the positive vorticity that's in the box going out, basically has its origin in this term. So it's W times times the standwise vorticity. And we know, we know, we know that uh, the flow coming down through here is W is negative, and we see it descending, and A is negative. So we know that that term is a positive, positive one. So, so this tells us that the, uh, the flow, this equation here has positive the vorticity in the box, the flowing out of the box, because of this term here. And it's saying W is negative, A is negative. Now, as you, saw, as you saw from the little uh, the visualization, you pull essentially the lambda by the time it reaches this point. So you could follow a parcel down like this, and the, the standwise vorticity equation reduces to this, there's no turbulence, and V bar is zero on the axis. And so uh, integrating the, uh, just integrating, uh, integrating along the trajectory, uh, shows that the source of vorticity is basically the baroclinic term. So the very basic source of vorticity is baroclinic. Um, and uh, it's, it's negative, as you'd expect. And uh, since it's sinking, this W times A is, uh, is a positive number. W is negative, A is negative. That's a positive number. That's the source of the vertical vorticity of the, uh, in the box. So we have a turbulent flow. It, uh, I haven't mentioned anything about PV yet, but this is the source. Baroclinic generation is the source of the vertical vorticity in, uh, in this turbulent flow. So where, where does it, uh, where does the turbulence come in then? Because we know it's turbulent, we saw it. Well, from this point forward, uh, we have turbulence. You know, and, and so when you do the analysis of the, uh, the span-wide vorticity, basically the A of the equation from this point forward, is a turbulent flow, and uh, basically you know, something like that. So the Reynolds stresses come in uh, to modify uh, eta. So basically, with the interpretation here is that if this was just a linear wave, then uh, and if you did this analysis through a linear wave, then you would take out as much vorticity as you put in. This, this interval would go to zero in a linear wave. But since you have turbulence, you basically have a transport through this line, but it, you don't have a recovery uh, that, that cancels it out right here. So you need, you need the turbulence, and I think that's what the PV analysis is picking up on. 
So uh, summarize, the continuous fluid version of the shallow water equation of hydraulic jump is basically this, is, is characterized by this backward breaking uh, wave with barricade to produce standardized vorticity. That's what the blue is here. And so the vorticity up to this point here is given by simply the interval of you know, following the parcel down the slope here, and you have negative vorticity. And since W is negative and uh, A is negative, this flux of standardized vorticity brings, brings vorticity from one side to the next side here. Now the fact, and so this picture is not so bad. Basically, it's, it's the integrated version of the, uh, you can have a lot of turbulence in here, but at the end of the day, uh, it really cares about is this vorticity that was produced by our clinically descending and, uh, and having a limited uh, standardized as well. Um, but to have it vorticity extending downstream, that's where the, uh, the role of uh, turbulent diffusion is. It allows this, uh, this integral here to not be canceled for the ascending flow coming out. So that's the role of turbulence. So uh, I'm not, uh, this basically is a uh, This is basically it. I have a couple of epilogue things. What epilogue is moments, but what is the role of PV? And so uh, what I did here is I thought, okay, let's do the analysis of uh, the time average uh, uh, omega bar, the time average uh, uh, theta bar. And uh, the, uh, the PV equation uh, has this uh, flux term and the flux from left to right it basically inherits this from the vorticity equation of this flux from left to right. So if you write the, uh, the term for the uh, flux of the potential vorticity, uh, you see you can break this into a frictional term and a heating term. And so I analyze the, uh, the uh, this JY term. This is negative, as you expect from this. And uh, you look at the frictional term and the uh, Term, you can see that the, uh, the, the term due to heating is uh, perhaps the uh, best describes this, this kind of tunnel of uh, PV that, that slips through the uh, that's, that slips through this level. And this, uh, I've seen this. I think this kind of suggests a nice geometrical uh, connection between the vorticity analysis and the PV analysis. See, these are the vorticity terms we were just talking about. Uh, this is the theta dz. That's positive. That's the, uh, that's the static stability. So basically, uh, the terms are very much uh, given by the signs of W uh, the vorticity terms. And the the uh, static stability is just positive. So uh, I'm going to show you a kind of a geometrical interpretation. Here, here's our uh, cartoon. Here's the thing. Uh, scroll the back on itself. And uh, so what I'm going to do now is uh, analyze the uh, time average of this, this surface together with the vortex lines in the steady state. I'm going to show, uh, I'll to direct your attention to uh, say this one first. So this is kind of looking in from uh, downstream, downward on the, this is the turbulent flow. It's kind of curling over these two vortex lines. And the vortex lines are color-coded such that a change in color, you know, the, the blue is kind of cold, and the green is warm. So on a vortex line down here, this is another view, the same you can see going through the surface, that's what PV is created through here. This one here essentially conserves its uh, theta. So it means theta is not varying on a vortex line. Uh, so that means PV is zero on that line. But the ones in the vortex line right next to it, that's coming up and over. And this one, uh, this, uh, this vortex line is basically being uh, going from cold to warm, PV is created here. Uh, uh, PV, this, this means that there's PV because the temperature is varying along, uh, theta is varying along the vortex line. On one side on this side and on the other side here. You see that there. And so the thing that the, uh, you say, well, where does this come from? Uh, if we look at the sort of the, the genesis, the early, the first time before the wavelengths, you can see all these features you know, the, this is the vortex line hugging the isotope. This is the blue one hugging the isotope. And this loop over here, uh, 
has zero PV, then it's, it's trying to hug this uh, the isotope. So I, I think it's kind of like a like a lion jumping through a hoop here. This this uh, this uh, this tongue of, 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 of uh, theta is about to come and capture uh, these these vortex lines, and then in so doing uh, mixes. Uh, and, uh, mixes in such a way as to produce these gradients of potential temperature on a vortex line. So this is sort of the, uh, the geometrical interpretation of the PV dipole that, uh, that forms in these, uh, in these flows. And the shallow water theory, is one, another epilogue here, is that you look at this and uh, shallow water theory, you know, in the case of the water, you have like, almost zero density here, and um, so where's baroclinic production? Where's the baroclinic production term in, in these equations? And uh, you don't see it directly in here. But I think we all know that it's kind of in, it's in the surface, right? Because it's cool here and warm here, or high density here or low density here. You don't directly see it. Um, and most people will buy it. Oh yeah, well, if you have these two fluids, low theta, you know, high, high theta, low theta, you will get and we'll get uh, down from the production. But this, the sticking point for a lot of folks is the, uh, is the actual shallow water when you go from high density to zero density, or almost a factor of a thousand. And so, uh, but the answer is still the same. Most of us learn water wave theory with, uh, say, it's irritational, and you have some good boundary conditions here on pressure and displacement. You use uh, the Lillies equation, and then you can solve the equation. But another, another way to look at this, I think more useful when you start thinking about wave breaking, is, uh, is to think about the free surface as a uh, vortex sheet. So uh, this group here, and Baker, Muir, and Orzag, in two, published uh, a technique, a good example here, showing a finite amplitude wave about to break, uh, where you take the, uh, the vorticity distribution, the delta function, in the, in the surface, of vorticity, and you invert it, you get the flow modifications, and then you, you vect and invert, and vect and invert, and vect and invert using the bio savar law, uh, vect and invert. And uh, they, they carried it to this point, uh, and I took out my Sharpie, <laughs> and I continued their calculations. <laughs> here. I think this is what it would have done, uh, had, the, uh, had the forecast gone longer. Look at Trump. But imagine, you have this positive vorticity all around. So no, here, we'll just reconnect, <coughs> draw a circuit to here, and now I'll see uh, circulation. There. If I take any circuit within here, there's no circulation. The vorticity is zero. But as soon as I take this, this, this positive vorticity around, then I take a circuit in here, I'll surrounding all the positive vorticity in it. That's where, the, that's where the circulation is coming from. It shows that there's, there, there's vorticity in the free surface. And uh, otherwise, if that's not true, how do you explain this? <laughs> right? This guy, I'm sure that when this water touches this water, if I take the circuit through here, I'm going to get a non-zero circulation. Where did it come from if not the free surface? Um, if you believe that, that's yes, this guy. <laughs> this is that. Uh, I found this in the journal of damn safety. So there is a journal of damn safety. And that's one of the things I worry about. Is, uh, is, uh, is uh, designing dams that something calls the drowning machine. You get stuck in here. Uh, it's kind of intuitive, but to get out, you gotta go down. Anyway, that's all I have. <laughs>
Yeah, downstream of this point, downstream of that point, it's uh, it's turbulent flow. So if you're in if you're in this part of the, yeah, if you're in the, yeah, if you're, if you're like out here at the, if this boulder, say, <laughs> and uh, if you're at you know, if you're on the slope, it might be laminar, and then if you're down here in this area, it'll be more gusty, according to this. If it really, you know, the thing is, this is an idealization of having all the stratification here. But the intensity of the maximum down slope in is not too much affected by all the details downstream. No, no, it's, it's mainly right here on the down on the slope in this case. But I mean, by, by design, we've taken out, you know, the typically stratified above and the substratification below. But we take this all out because this is what. We're trying to simulate with a more complete model, dynamically complete model, the situation that shallow water is trying to represent. The shallow water theory just has one density here, a jump in density, and another density here. No frictional contact with the obstacle. So this is basically take shallow water theory. It's a situation that is trying trying to, to simulate, and now spread out the, the jump, give it a finite thickness. And now, using the Stokes equations, you see what the complete solution looks like. So the the hydraulic jump is really turbulent. Yes. You started out at the beginning showing a satellite image. There was a lee vortice. Those are those are almost the equilibrium kind of solution. Right. So what's the link between your time average kind of underlying vortice and the turbulence? That's a really good question. It, I probably should have given you another example from, from reality. The, in, in that case, the, the, uh, this surface here intersects the obstacle. Oh, because the, the, it's not going over the obstacle. Right. Right, okay. And that's a much more complicated situation from shallow water. Here. They form little hydraulic jumps on the edges. Okay. In fact, let me just... That's have you have you tried to simulate yes. that with the PE and yes, let me show you. <laughs> okay. Yeah. 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 That's that's basically. Yeah. So basically, that's that's this situation. You'll have to drag it onto the other monitor because I unmirrored them. Okay. Yeah. So. Uh, surface is forming, it, it cut, the obstacle cuts through it, and so it's a much more complicated, and, and, and the Sharon Smith article have that case covered, but there is a lot more sort of uh, uncertainty because you have the shallow water layer going to zero on the slope, and you have to do a lot of fancy footwork with the, with the numerics in order to get it to, uh, to do you know, something that does not not obviously wrong. So what I'm doing here is, is the simpler case where the, where the, where the, where the, uh, the shallow water covers the obstacle. There's no question about what happens at uh, the intersection point. But with uh, this flow here, what I did with Craig at Pifanio, this is just that case. Right? And so when you do the case with the width of formula, is basically something that you can interpret as, a, as these kind of lease side. Uh, they call them uh, you know, side side shots. Right. So yeah. hydraulic jumps on the side. But it's a much more complicated you know, flow to analyze and to convince everybody. Because then you can have a uh, miracle, what's going on with shot one. They still produce PV. You get these, they call them flank shots. Flank shocks. I guess a rock that's above the water level will that would be the, that would be more to see on the side that would be that would be enough. Yeah. And I would argue still it's it's barrel production. Okay. So 
what's the role of, of a mountain wave now? You know, the, the regular deep mountain wave. I, I'm I'm assuming it's kind of like this the old Clark paper where the mountain, the deep mountain wave establishes this ducting yeah. down low levels. Yeah. Yeah, I think this, in, in, when, you have the, when you have the uh, the shallow water flow, I mean, there's, there's no possibility of uh, a wave propagation alone because mm -hmm. the density theta is constant, so it's already, it's already trapped. But in the case of say a boulder windstorm, is it usually a two-step process where you establish the, yes. the duct first and then? I think that's the that's the case. I mean, I remember at the, at the at the forecast systems lab, there was a chart, yeah. decision tree, and the decision tree always had something to do with reflecting, keeping wave energy down. I've always been a little confused over whether you you have to have this duct in the synoptic scale or the duct is formed by the by the mountain wave breaking along. I, th I think there's a, a you could have either one. Okay. I think there's a that Dale, Duran, Dale Duran's article and another look at downslope windstorm. Back in 1987, so we did a number of cases where you could know where, you know, depending on how you distribute the, uh, you know, how the score parameter works out, uh, you can get enough duct into. But, but in the recent Santa Ana winds that yeah. we just had, that was a one step process as yeah. far as I can see, yeah. from the boundary layer being just higher than the mountains. Yeah. Yeah, right. Yeah, but, it's, but the answer to your question is that. There's a, uh, at least from the modeling world, there uh, seems to be both ways. It seems to be the critical step is somehow keeping the energy down. Mm -hmm. Having something either wave breaking that you know, Clark can help you identify as something to keep uh, energy from propagating upward, or cleverly arranged, you know, precisely arranged layers that keep the energy from propagating up. Mm -hmm. Because basically mm -hmm. what happens in something like this, the only place the energy tra travels in something like this is horizontally. So you get to a point that you do have a time dependent problem. You see that you know, the wave starts steepening, steepening, and then tries to come back, and then it, even before it gets double value, the, uh, the theory is broken down because the theory, shallow water theory, assumes that the horizontal scale is much bigger than the vertical scale of the motion. And once you get to a steep surface, it's no longer valid. So even before it becomes double value, and it's obviously out the window, right there. Yeah, so that's a, this is a parameterization. I, I really enjoyed your uh, posing that paradox, and I realized that, wow, I have to read these nice uh, references that you've shown us, uh, because I've been laboring along without having been kind of aware of this. I'm talking with Greg Tripp there, though. Um, what happens when a convective updraft hits the face of the stratosphere, it creates a pair of counter-rotating vertices, and how and why. So I'm sort of in the camp of tangential stresses are important, but it's a frictional direct source term that every does the equation, but Greg points out, perhaps correctly, that warping theta surfaces could explain all of it. And it seems similar to what you're saying. And what do you think about that? Are both kind of partly true at the same time? Or what, well, what's uh, the resolution? If, if your question is where does the rotation come from, and I'd advise you to uh, look at this equation. And uh, I mean, this, is, this is exact. And, and what Greg is talking about, about the, the deformed data surface, that's, they're going to be producing the horizontal components of electricity. And this, and then if you do your not, and this is nice because uh, you only have to do one level, the level you're interested in, and look at horizontal fluxes. Because hmm. you know vertical zero. So if your interest is in the actual source, I would take a box. Uh, can, I, can, I, can I draw some? Draw some over here. Oh yeah, this the theorem is really easy. It's uh, it's easy enough to do on the box. The equation of motion is going to be written like this. So the acceleration and the forces you like on the right hand side. The vorticity, by definition, is that. <coughs> okay, so, so, so if I operate 
uh, on this equation with uh, epsilon on n k equal to k. And this becomes e by the t of the time. So I can change the e by the t of the epsilon e by the x k. I just bring it here. I bring this over to the left hand side of the equation. Minus x1 on the equation e by the x minus k. So this is just a constant control coming on the inside. So this becomes This is the vortices in flux tensor. Uh, like that. And uh, the boundary of that that I referred to before is that the V and I are zero. So you can track here. There's no, there's no contribution. To the work. If you're in the if you're interested in the I component, and you write out fluxes, there's no contribution to the I component because of this. So it's just a property of, of uh, basically taking the curl of the equation uh, of the motion. And if you put it in a flux form, that's the point. And so if you want to track down sources, let's start with this equation. And uh, yeah, don't try to do this in, uh, you know, I read this, this, is, this is in the Haynes and McIntyre paper. But uh, don't try to do this without using Cartesian tensors because it becomes much more complicated. Any other questions for our speaker? Well, let's thank uh, Rich again for a wonderful talk.